Welcome to Decode Your Burnout, the podcast where we crack the code on burnout based on three primary factors, your programming, environment, and personality. We also feature experts who debunk the myths about what it takes to be successful in their industry and spin those tips to fit the workplace so you can optimize the way you work. I'm your host, Dr. Sharon Grossman, a psychologist turned coach, author, and burnout expert. If you're burned out and want to go from exhausted to extraordinary, book a free breakthrough session with me by going to bookachatwithsharon.com. And if you want to see how you're doing and what to focus on next, download the burnout checklist. You'll find the link in the show notes or go to bit.ly forward slash check your burnout. Now let's get started. Hello, Decode Your Burnout fans. And thank you for joining me for another episode of our wonderful podcast with me, Dr. Sharon Grossman. And I am joined today by Dr. Amy Ohana, who helps burned out people fall in love with work again. She's a licensed professional counselor in Oregon and a full-time professor at the University of Western States. Amy's research interests are human potential and motivation, erotic intelligence, which isn't necessarily about sexuality, and spirituality. She's the author of two published books, When Your Child is Grieving and Beyond Burnout, What to Do When Your Work Isn't Working for You. Her passion is to help people reconnect with themselves, the divine, and work so that they can experience life to the fullest. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sharon. So great to be here. You are doing such amazing work, and I love that you're in the burnout space. You're doing it a little bit differently than I am. And I think one of the things that really maybe intrigued my interest was uh, this whole idea of erotic intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could maybe speak to that and if that ties in at all to this idea of burnout or burnout prevention. Mm -hmm. For sure. I became interested in the term erotic intelligence recently when I read a relationship book by world-renowned psychoanalyst or psychotherapist Esther Perel. Mm. Um, Prior to that, though, when I was writing my book, Beyond Burnout, um, I've always been a little bit of a mystic and had um, just very deep connected experiences with the divine or, or God or whatever word you use for that. Um, And when I was writing my book, Beyond Burnout, I had this very vivid dream or experience um, with the word eros, which is the Greek word for passionate love. When I began researching the true meaning of that word, it really didn't have as much to do with romance or sexuality as it did with connection. The root of the word actually... um, means oneness or deep connection. And so that experience that I had, that dream I had was actually more about um, love energy or passion related to connection that we have for our work. And that was how the Beyond Burnout book came about, specifically chapter 10. Um, From there, it sort of launched my interest in erotic intelligence, which When you look at the root of the word erotic, which is really an adjective of the word eros, it has more to do with how we feel connected to our work um, and how we feel disconnected, which is really what creates burnout. Yeah. So we are going to come back to this. We're going to take a little bit of a sandwich approach. So that was uh, one slice of the bread. And in the middle of the sandwich, we're going to ask you to tell your burnout story and then come back and talk more about erotic intelligence and how sure. being passionate about your work ties into burnout and burnout prevention. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell, take us on, on the journey, help us understand what happened to you, what were you doing and why did you burn out? What, what was going on there? I've always been a type A high achiever kind of person. And when I finished my bachelor's degree in psychology, I became a social worker and I entered the field uh, pretty young, naive and on fire. 
I was going to go save the world. And I found out pretty quickly that was not going to happen. And I burned out and it was so severe. I actually thought about going back to school to get an MBA because in my burnout state, I was like, what's going to give me the, the best um, life money, um, not meaning money. So I started studying for the GMAT, applied to business schools, and then I just knew um, deep down that wasn't the, the career for me. I was um, made to be a teacher and a writer and a helper. And so I had to figure out this burnout thing in order to do the work that I was made to do and that I was truly passionate about. So would you say that, you know, you kind of gave us some ideas, kind of broad strokes about what led you to burnout. And you talked about how you were trying to save the world, you were naive. So what does that translate into? Were you like working too many hours? Or were you feeling like, you know, a lot of times people feel very guilty for focusing on themselves. It's like, I have to give everything away all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what was happening for you that you ended up burning out? Well, I certainly was, was working um, long hours and um, pretty perfectionistic, I think. And of course, in social work, high caseloads, um, demanding um, environment, all of those external environmental things were present for me. But what I learned um, in my own personal journey and actually in my research, um, because I ended up writing my doctoral dissertation on burnout, what I learned was that our internal methods of coping, including the messages we send to ourselves, have just as much to do with burnout as those environmental stressors that we experience. And so the burnout journey of resolution is really coming back to oneself and learning um, about one's personal patterns of coping, how we see the world, our personal belief systems, and also how we make meaning, especially around um, our work and what our work um, does for our own personal sense of meaning, the messages that and the ways we define ourselves through work. And I'm so glad that you brought up this idea of the messages of coping and the belief system, because that is your programming. And that is certainly one of the big contributors. You know, you mentioned prior to that, it was a demanding environment. There were a lot of, uh, uh, there's a large caseload. So there's a lot of those kind of environmental stressors, but mm -hmm. certainly your programming coupled with that environment was you know, even more fuel to the fire. So can you talk to us a little bit about those messages of coping that you were referring to? We, we'd love to get maybe an inside glance of what that sounds like, because I'm mm -hmm. sure a lot of people listening to this can probably identify with those. Well, um, so I'll just be really candid um, and share some of some of the messages that I had picked up along the way, maybe in my early life. Um, and how I had to confront them. So for me, I really equated my worth with my performance. I'm not good enough unless I achieve. And it took me a long time for me to realize that that was a subconscious message. It was like a tape running through my head that I had to actively confront and change. Um, I think for many women, we um, experience similar messages around our worth. Um, and value based on how we look, um, how we perform, how we manage, and how we care, how we care for people. Um, and that's just socioculturally sort of embedded in women, especially in Western cultures um, and working women, um, that we, uh, we just unfortunately um, experience and, and have to confront at some point along the way um, to be well and whole. You know, I, as you're saying this, I, I find it absolutely fascinating how we're not taught, as you say, to think about our worth independent of our productivity and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost as if the opposite is true. It's almost like we all go to class and the lesson is you're not worthy unless you produce something. Because I have to tell you, so many people that I talk to and that I work with have that exact same belief. 
And it's unbelievable how, how profound and how uh, across the board you see this with people. It is so incredibly common, right? So, you know, thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that, but it's also not really unique. It's actually like, as, as we could say, jokingly, very popular. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. It's kind of like, it's a tape many of us carry around in our heads that we're, we feel really ashamed about. And um, when we actually start talking about it and addressing it, it's like, oh, I'm not alone in this. Actually, this is a very normal, I'm more normal than I am abnormal. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. It's so incredibly common. So, uh, so you have this programming and you have this very uh, strong environment that basically demands a lot out of you. And you're this A type personality, you're a doer, right? And you're trying to save the world. So, you know, it all kind of feeds into each other and then the burnout happens. And then you spend time really thinking about your dissertation and your own experience and you you put together the book. So mm -hmm. along the way, I'm sure you've picked up on some of the biggest myths around burnout. Can you share with us what those might be? Sure. So myth number one is I can fix my burnout by fixing my schedule or quitting my job. Um, I think many of us, and we get these cultural messages too, like, oh, just set better goals or manage my schedule better or take a good vacation. Those are certainly great things and please do them. But it is burnout is just as much an internal problem as it is an external one. The problem is not, it's about meaning, how we derive meaning and identity from work, just as much as it is about managing managing the external, the, day, the daily grind. So to alleviate burnout, it's a process. It's first a process of sitting with yourself and asking yourself, where am I disconnected? And pulling those fragmented pieces of your whole self, including your work, but especially your work back into one whole sense of you and into that place where you can find both rest and passion. And I know that might sound a little bit ambiguous, and I'm, I can certainly explain that a little more. But um, just, just to answer your question, the myth of burnout is, the first myth is, I can fix this through goal setting or changing my external world. That's the myth. The actual accurate answer is, it's both. And I need to start with me. I need to start with what's going on, the disconnection within me. And given everything that we know about your story, it makes a lot of sense because if you're burning out because you think that you have something to prove that you need to feel a sense of worthiness based on your production, then you are focusing externally and doing that brings on the burnout. Mm hmm but it stems from within, from that feeling of, I am not worthy unless fill in the blank. And therefore, the work actually has to be internal. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so take us through myth number two. Okay, so myth number two is that women experience burnout the same way that men do. Um, there's not a whole lot of people talking about this um, today that I found. Um, and one of the things that I've learned in my own personal story, as well as the research, is that women engage with work differently than men. We find meaning in a different way than, than men do. And of course, I'm speaking um, according to stereotypes. Um, so if you don't identify with this, um, maybe just use it as a point of, of conversation, a place to start a conversation. But um, in general, Women who identify as she, her, and experience a lot of feminine energy are more concerned with connection, how we connect with our work um, and finding ways to feel passionate about our work and feeling connected within ourself. Men, he, him, in their masculine energy, tend to focus on task completion and doing, um, which is also amazing and um, very necessary in our workforce. The problem is that when women go to work in a masculine workforce that's about doing, 
when our natural style is more about connection and being, we have to work twice as hard to do than our male colleagues do, because it's not as natural for us to step into that doing energy. We can do it for sure. That's what makes us rock stars. But um, we have to rest more and rest in more creative um, ways that actually help us feel rested. Um, because we've extended double the energy um, than, um, than others than our male colleagues have to complete the very same task. So where that becomes a problem is if me as a woman, professional woman, I don't recognize that and I don't know how to rest in ways that reconnect myself, that reconnect um, just sort of that sense of passion and creativity. Um, if I'm eventually just going to get very, very burned out um, and um, maybe not even allow myself um, that kind of rest or that sustained period of rest, which it can, again, create can create all kinds of problems like physical problems and um, just sustained um, seasons of burnout. So it's really interesting that you said that because a couple of weeks ago, we had Bridget Mamari on the show and she was talking about living in your masculine energy and mm -hmm. kind of like you, she's a type A who when she was working and she was a lawyer, she talked about being the doer and, and being in that go, go, go mentality. Again, coming from that place of I have something to prove. And she was talking not so much about men versus women, but that masculine versus feminine energy and how we're out of alignment. And I'm curious what you think about that. Is it, is it like a gender thing or is it an energy thing? And, um, you know, you're talking about women being in the workforce that is predominantly male driven. So it's sounding like what you're saying is the environment has more of that masculine energy and women are mm -hmm. trying to fit in and they turn on more of that masculine energy within them and they're burning out because they're out of alignment. But I'm also curious then what happens to the men who maybe are just as much in that masculine energy, uh, and out of alignment with their feminine energy? Super good question. So I absolutely agree with uh, Bridget on that, on this. Um, sometimes the root of what I study is, is energy. So masculine energy and feminine energy and put in those terms um, is absolutely how I would state it. When I start talking about masculine and feminine energy, especially to conservative or, um, you know, pretty hardcore professional people, it doesn't land so well sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it sounds a little new age. Um, but that essentially is the crux of what this is, is that we as human beings embody both masculine and feminine energy. The workforce is, is masculine. It's a masculine environment. So people who identify, typically women, she, her, who identify as um, having feminine energy walk into a masculine uh, dominated workforce and we, the, our energy is just sucked out of us double. Mm -hmm. um, for uh, masculine dominant energetic beings, uh, men, he, him, usually not always, um, they go to work. Yes, absolutely. They'll burn out. Um, and their process of burnout resolution is very similar. It's, it's finding where um, they need to reconnect or examining those disconnections, um, but also to learn how to step back into their feminine energy, the state, a state of being um, and finding rest in that state of being um, as well for men that may not be as, as natural um, as it is for women. And we, um, each of us, regardless of how we identify, um, will have our own process of undoing those shoulds and those messages that we picked up along the way of, um, am I allowed to rest? Um, is it okay for me to uh, engage in um, this activity as, as a method of my healing? Is it okay to be quote unquote uh, selfish when really um, it's, it's a matter, it's a, it's a matter of um, self care is a, is really just a matter of um, reintegrating oneself. Am I allowed to do that process? Yes or no. So for 
all humans, all professional people, regardless of how you identify in your body. Um, it is that it's a very similar process, but it might be unique to each one. Yeah. So as, as you're saying this, I'm thinking about this idea of erotic intelligence mm -hmm. and how you're trying to help people fall back in love with their work. And I know that um, not everybody burns out because they're not in love with their work. Sometimes they're too in love with their work and they're not <laughs> yeah. in balance with their life. But, you know, as you're thinking about this masculine and feminine energy and helping people become more aligned with a sense of passion is, is the idea here that that erotic intelligence and that passion in your work, more of a feminine energy that balances out the masculine? And if so, what does that look like? Eros or the erotic is a feminine energy. It's the energy of oneness and connection um, and from which passion is born. And so for she, her beings, we connect with that um, very deeply because that's just a natural form of our energy. So um, the erotic intelligence piece is learning to recognize that, learning to embrace it. Um, and that's a big one for many of us because the word erotic brings up a lot of stuff for a lot of people. Um good and bad, positive and negative, um, learning to embrace that erotic energy within the self, and then learning how to channel it and engage it in ways that are productive and pro-social. Um, and for some of us, that might be a learning curve as well, um, because uh, the erotic and or sexuality tends to be a part of the human um, being our human psyche that is split off quite a bit, um, it, hidden, perhaps um, a very important and valuable piece of us. Um, part of what I study is that, um, or, or the message that I have is that the erotic is not just about sexuality. It's about so much more than that. It's about um, life force energy. So learning how to reconnect with that and integrate all of that energy into the core self. And I gotta imagine when you're talking about creating that connection, the meaning and the purpose for some people, especially the ones that are burning out, maybe because as we said, they're too passionate about just their work mm -hmm. and they're letting the rest of their life slide away from them. Maybe it's about reconnecting to other parts of your life and creating mm -hmm. more of a balance across the board. So for, for that kind of um, person, perhaps their journey towards erotic intelligence is learning um, how to uh, not, th they, it sounds like they may have already embraced the erotic within themselves. Their journey might be to learn how to channel it in, in better ways for them so that they don't burn out because they're overly passionate about something, their work or one particular thing. And so we're talking about reigniting your love for your career, maybe finding more balance across the board with your life. What about the people who are, as you mentioned in your story, are out of sync with themselves, right? They don't have a lot of the self-love and self-compassion. They're focused so much on saving everybody else, but they're working themselves, you know, basically to the point of burnout. Wouldn't you say there's, there's room in this idea of erotic intelligence of finding more self-love for your, you know, more passion, more um, compassion for yourself? Well, um, I would argue that, or my perspective would be that for an individual in that state, um, you are in a state of disconnection. If you aren't feeling whole in who you are, um, exhibited by a lack of love for self, um, the first journey is, is to find that wholeness. And that comes back to that whole idea of oneness. You're disconnected within yourself. And so why is it um, that you can't love yourself? What is it? What's the block there that's preventing you from wholly embracing, accepting, holding, loving yourself and working on that block? And that's your first point of healing. It's not about your work. I mean, that's certainly going to come somewhere along the road, but um, that first piece is reconnecting, re-knitting the self. So there are multiple layers to this idea of erotic intelligence. You can work on your relationship with yourself. 
you work on your passion and meaning around your career and your work, and certainly more uh, about your life at large. And so there's a lot of work that we can do to increase that form of intelligence in our lives is what it sounds like. And I love that you are integrating all of this spirituality into the idea of our existence here on the planet and showing us how to do it in really concrete ways. Um, Amy, any other tips that you want to share with people listening who are struggling right now? Well, um, first of all, I just want to normalize your experience. This is this is a very normal part of the um, U.S. workforce or the workforce um, all over the world, especially in Western cultures. Um, one thing that I'll address is the third myth, um, which is burnout is depression. Um, so oftentimes when you feel burned out, you might wonder if, hey, am I clinically depressed? Do I need medication? Um, so my answer to that is you could be, but let's look at how burnout differentiates from depression. They have almost exactly the same set of criteria. So that means with burnout, you'll have um, the emotional exhaustion. Perhaps you can't focus anymore. You, you're physically exhausted. You can't complete tasks like you usually would. Perhaps you're having sleep disturbance, weight gain, feelings of worthlessness, I basically just recited the diagnostic criteria for major depressive disorder. So the big question is, am I burned out or am I depressed? And the answer to that question is burnout always comes from your occupation or work. So if you can link your symptoms to your occupation or work or vocational identity, because vocation is different than our work sometimes, um, then you're looking more at burnout and the process of healing that or addressing that might be a little bit different than if you were um, treating clinical depression. Thank you so much for sharing that because I think that is something that's often confused. They look so much alike and it's sometimes that we have both, but a lot of times it's that one mimics the other and we're not really sure what to do. And it's important to really be able to diagnose the problem correctly in order to have the right kind of treatment, which is really along the lines of what we're doing here with regards to burnout on the show, right? We want to help people decode their burnout so they find custom tailored solutions. It's not Absolutely. a one size fits all. So yeah, that's really, really important. So Amy, you're doing all this amazing work. You're helping people fall back in love with their work and um, just find that connection back to their life, their job, um, tune into their spiritual side, if you will. Uh, if somebody is interested in looking you up or maybe reaching out to you, where can they find you? They can find me online at www.amyohanna.com, no apostrophe in Ohana, and I'm on LinkedIn as well. Wonderful. Well, for all of you thinkers, feelers, and doers out there, I hope that you take this to heart, that no matter what's happening right now in your work, you can find your passion and your purpose again. And of course, regardless of whatever your personality code is, my goal is to spread the word that burnout is a unique experience. And by decoding it, you can find solutions that are equally unique to you. Please help me spread this message by subscribing to the show on Apple or Spotify and leaving us a review, telling us what you think, feel, or do differently because of the show. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you can leave me a comment or questions to answer in future episodes. And please recommend the show to anyone you know that's struggling with burnout. If you're ready to take the next step with me to decode your burnout, Go to decodeyourburnout.com and I'll have all of Amy's wonderful information and links to her books in the show notes. So make sure to check that out and I'll see you right back here next week.